Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next panel. Um, our moderator for today is going to be Pamela Standing, Executive Director of the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance. Um, we also will be welcoming our panelists, Candice Kwan, Marketing and Research Specialist for the Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico, Raymond Anton, for, uh, Food Production Supervisor for the San Xavier Co-op Forum, Joshua Preston, Food Production Assistant for the San Xavier Co-op Forum as well, Rochelle Morrison, co-founder of Res Chicks Fresh Eggs Cooperative, and uh, Catherine uh, Minthorn, Technical Assistant Specialist for the Intertribal Agriculture Council, uh, and on the Board of Directors for the Res Chicks Fresh, Fresh Eggs Cooperative as well. So Pamela, I will go ahead and turn that over to you. Thank you. We had a slide that we were gonna start with. And um, these are the faces of our relatives and children and grandchildren. They're our future. We've been inspired. I've been attending these for the last two days and just have been so inspired up by the speakers and the quality of work and what people are doing in their communities and, uh, you know, and what we're doing to feed our communities you know, to take care of that. And over the last two days, we've heard a lot of conversations about self-determination, trade confederacies and kinship trade agreements and the way and ways nations can come together and explore sharing costs, technology, and using the very best of what they have in their own communities. And one of the things that, you know, I really feel is that this is no longer about indigenizing a Western model. We feel it's about reclaiming our own narrative and doing what we know is best for our communities. So we're really excited. We would like to bring on our, um, on our panelists and the first presenters will be the Res Chicks and they're gonna share about their egg cooperative so we're looking forward to having Katherine Minthorn and Shelley Morrison. Good morning. I uh, I believe Catherine's on here with me. Um, my name's Shelley Morrison. I am from Pendleton, Oregon, and Katherine is a really good friend of mine. We've been friends for quite a few years. Um, gotten involved in quite a few things and projects and it led to Res Chicks Fresh Egg Cooperative. Um, I believe, I don't know who I instruct to move on to the next slide. There are four founding members. Um, Catherine and I are here today. Uh, Deb Harris is also one of them and Paula Wallace, but they're unable to attend today. So <clears throat> Catherine and I have done quite a few things. We're involved in, um, projects. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are um, fun. And this is one of the fun ones. Uh, we had talked about getting chickens uh, for the kids because they were interested in them. And, and last year, I'm sure a lot of people made decisions uh, for food and stuff like that. And we decided to go ahead and do it since we were in a Pen or quarantining and really didn't have, we had the time to do it. And um, that's kind of where our story starts with the chickens. Um, we wanted to teach our kids about it. We wanted them to understand uh, where their food come from. Food security came up quite a bit. And uh, we have cows that we raise for beef. So we have beef that we have for ourselves. Um, we also sell it. And Chickens just was kind of another step in that food security. And our idea came about one day, I was playing around on the internet and, and I said, well, I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna order chickens. And when they're little, they are so cute and little and don't take up much space. So it was not hard for us to kind of <laughs> over order chickens. Um, when I ordered the 28 chickens in April, they weren't scheduled to be delivered until June and you just couldn't get them at a feed supply store around here. They would sell out so fast. And so one day I was in our feed supply store here in town and, and I called her up and said, hey, there's some chickens up here. We should get some in practice. <laughs> and so uh, we did, we got 12 chickens 
that we thought we could see if we could keep them alive. And the mortality rate with chicks is pretty high. Um, there's a lot of different factors that fact into that. You know, some of them just, some of them have just died and we don't know why, but uh, our goal was to teach the kids about food protection, production, you know, so that they understand that um, it, food doesn't just, isn't just born in a grocery store, that somebody puts the work into it. And so they did learn that with the cows. Um, they raised, successfully raised four steers and we um, sold them to uh, friends and family who were interested in having homegrown beef. And so now we're on to chickens and caring for them. Um, we kind of had a lot of learning stuff in the beginning for them before they could really handle them and play with them. And now we're up to about 50 plus chickens. Um, all of our 12 chickens survived, the first baby chicks. And then when we got the order, we got 34 chicks. And then we've managed to acquire more. Um, I bought 10 more at the feed store um, that were some last of a batch. And so we still have baby chicks, but we were, we did a little bit better than we thought because they all survived. I mean, we, and then we were just like, what do we do with all these millions of chickens? And we've moved on to the next slide, I believe. Um, so then with all of these baby chicks in the beginning, it was pretty easy because they were in a little, uh, they were in a little coop that we had made or a makeshift a, a brooder that we had. Um, and then we had to go to a place a little more permanent. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was predator proof and rodent proof. And so we went with the hard wire. Chicken wire is good for some, you know, it's good, but it won't keep a lot of things out. And so we went with that hard wire cloth. Um, it's little half inch squares. Um, we decided to make some kind of a Legos type panels so we could move them around and adjust them. And so we just made basic plant panels to be able to make what we needed, like if we needed to move them around. Um, we build them a make, uh, kind of a, a shelter so that they could be safe from predators, a place to close them in at night um, to keep them safe. And we can move on to the next slide. Um, then we started finding really good equipment. Um, it was kind of on the higher end of price, but it, this stuff, you know, when you're investing, you really have to make sure that, you know, you don't, if you invest in things that aren't higher quality, a lot of times you'll be investing again. And so we went with some things that were pretty nice. Um, that chicken feeder, go forward two slides. This chicken feeder right here, whoops, back one. Uh, this chicken feeder that we have, it, that lid closes the chicken standing on a treadle that opens that up. Um, it protects their feed from other animals, um, birds, rodents, because when they stand on that, it usually scares them away or when they hit that. But the chickens uh, were taught to eat feed out of that. Um, it took about, I think about a week, I believe, Catherine, for them to be able to go from it being closed to open. Um, there's a little process that goes with it. It works out wonderfully. It holds about 30 or 40 pounds of feed. Um, we fill them up, we have two of them. They're so great, we have two. We have two of them that fill them up once a week. The chickens feed themselves, their food is protected. Um, there's less waste, no rodents, very convenient for us. Um, you can, and then there's other things. We've uh, have water buckets that you put these little uh, water nipples on, and the chickens peck at it, and the water comes out. And so, 
there's not a lot of water waste there. That's pretty convenient. Um, it's really clean. And with the buckets having lids, chickens tend to try to swim and they uh, drown. So if they get in the water, then we've had lost two of them to that water troughs and we've come up with um, putting wood in there so that they have something to stand on. But these water buckets, I don't have a picture of that. They're pretty convenient. Um, fill them up and the chickens know how to feed or water from them. Catherine finds a lot of this stuff. Um, she's pretty good at finding good equipment that will go with, with what we have. And in our cooperative, our goal is to have everything pretty uniform. So we are getting feeders uh, for, we would like everybody to have these kind of feeders those kind of buckets they're clean um, they make everything pretty convenient and um, we're working on settling on a a coop so that it's we want everything to be pretty uniform in the way everything's done there's nesting boxes that we have that are roll away nesting boxes where the the chickens will lay the eggs in the boxes and then it rolls out into a protected area and you lift the lid and collect the eggs keeps them clean, um, keeps them from getting pecked at or <clears throat> broken or covered in whatever's on the chicken's feet. Um, that's a grandpa's feeder is what that is. And then our nesting box is the, Catherine, can you help me out? Best nest box. Best nest box, that's what it is. And then, if we go to the next slide. And there they are. The reason that we kind of got into this, um, those are our kids. Uh, my oldest daughter, Denise, is on the left. My youngest is on the in the middle, Cecilia, and Catherine's grandson, Miles. Um, these guys have been running around for a couple years together. They, uh, they're really good friends and I have a feeling they're gonna grow up to be kind of cohorts or partners in crime like Catherine and I are. But uh, we started, let's see, we started um, growing and laying the eggs. I, they started, I think about in September. Um, we had a few here and there later in the summer and then about September we, really started getting eggs. Um, we had 46 chickens and then we lost a couple to different things. There was uh, dog. dog attacks. Yeah, there was a dog attack, two dog attacks, one neighbor from the north and a neighbor from the south. Um, we lost, I think, six total to that. Um, we had dog attacks at my house. We have two. Catherine lives out on the reservation and I live in town and we have some of the chickens here. And so we had dog attacks at our house too. They were my dogs, but some of those chickens were attacked and it, they're really remarkable because they were able to heal. And these are the things that we find out along the way. You know, I mean, we, by no means did we ever have a lot of history in raising chickens. Um, in fact, I never thought I would own one. I was attacked by one when I was four and had stitches and all kinds of things and I hated chickens. But I've got over my fear and, and they're very fun. They, I, I do like them. Um, back the, also, also that summer, um, I worked for Intertribal Agriculture Council and we were participating in a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, there was a lot of information coming through about the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the funding sources available. So the USDA uh, Food Nutrition Services, the Fredipper program, which is the, oh, what's it called? Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. That's what <clears throat> it stands for. Consulting with the tribes for, um, they were uh, addition of locally sourced traditional foods, 
you know, for example, buffalo, wild rice, salmon. <clears throat> That's also where I noticed that they added the fresh eggs. So um, we started talking about the possibility of being able to be a vendor for the USDA to provide the fresh eggs on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. If you want to go to the next slide. So here we go with um, our eggs. We have a wide variety of eggs. When I bought the chickens, when I bought the ones online, I had opted for a, uh, I believe it was a rainbow pack. And so I ordered specifically some Buff Orpingtons because they're nice chickens, some Rhode Island Reds, they're docile and really nice chickens and they uh, are good layers, but I wanted color. And if we're gonna do something for fun, let's really have fun with it. So I went with colored eggs and we have a lot. I'm mean, at my house, it's basically just green and blue eggs um, that you can see that there's a, 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 go ahead, Catherine. Variety of sizes. We need to, we need yeah. to get through this a little faster. Yeah. The variety of sizes. Um, that's the one on the left is the, older, more mature ones, but those ones on the right, that little one, those are the pullet eggs. And those are, um, you only get those for about the first week or so. Um, we started selling those to uh, a lady in town who was interested. Um, we go to her restaurant and, and so she was our first customer. It was pretty exciting because we didn't have any customers. Um, go to the next slide. In December, and then, uh, in December, I work with Diane. I, I actually sit on the board of directors for the Northwest Cooperative Development Center. And she had contacted me, it was like New Year's Eve day, about some other business. And it kind of pinged in my head. Um, we should try to start a, and I had talked to the other ladies about it prior to that. And Diane happened to call. So uh, January 11th, we had our first meeting, a Zoom meeting, and we've had them every Monday since then. We still continue to do that. Uh, it's Monday every day from 1.30 to 3. If you go to the next slide. Uh, March, March 29th, we filed with the state of Oregon Res Chicks uh, Cooperative was recognized as legitimate cooperative. The tribe didn't have any regulations in place for our formation. Uh, about that same time, we applied for our EIN number, our DUNS number, and our SAMS number. We received all of those. Um, Shelly and I had already had a bank account at First Community that we were putting the egg money in but then we opened one on behalf of Res Chicks and we're all uh, on that, all four of the founding members are on that bank account at that credit union. Next slide. We've also applied for a USDA Rural Development Grant and Value Added Producer Grant, requested $25,000 and we would utilize that for labeling, advertising, egg cartons, insurance and refrigeration. We're waiting to hear on that. We should hear, we were told we would hear uh, probably in August. So we're really waiting to hear on that right now. Next slide. Um, with the VAPG grant in our application, we partnered with uh, Pendleton High School Future Farmers of America program. They have the uh, egg instructor there has curriculum that will be used to encompass youth into our program. Uh, we partnered with the Umatilla Tribes, um, the CDFI. Um, they have provided some financial record keeping for our youth and ordered um, workbooks for them when we bring our when we bring the kids in on to our program. We, we wanted to do it this year, but everything has moved so fast and we haven't been able to get the kids up and going with it yet. Other kids outside of the three of ours. Um, we have a commitment from MOFA's Cafe, which is a, one of the cafes in the food court of the um, casino on the reservation. And also from the tribe's mission market uh, to purchase eggs there. Next slide. 
This one we just found out two days ago, I think maybe Monday or yesterday. Yesterday. Yesterday, uh, the Oregon Food Bank, um, one of my people that I network uh, with in Oregon NRCS forwarded some information on some grants that were available and I was scanning through them and I saw the Oregon Food Bank uh, specifically that that uh, so the grower support mini grant and you know it was specific to Indian country in the state of Oregon and <clears throat> we contacted uh, the ladies that were ahead of that program and they advised us that no tribes or tribal members had applied for that and the, the grant the application had been closed but they extended it to us and we filled out that application to again, as Shelly was saying earlier, to provide the uniform equipment across the board for all of our cooperative members so that the standards for our, for our egg production would be the same. Everyone will have the same type of feeders, nesting boxes, water containers. Um, if in fact- Kind of helps keep, keeps the quality across the board, which is what we're going for high quality, so. And we, we received that one as well. We should have, we emailed in the W9 yesterday and the checks will be cut and mailed out to us as well. So I don't know if there's one more slide, but I think that was our last one. That's us. <laughs> we, met, <laughs> we met this spring with Diane. She came into Pendleton and we met with her and finalized some, I can't remember, we were finalizing paperwork on something, but we all met with her that day. I think that's about it's been an adventure it's been a, it's been an adventure learning a lot of things but you know some of that like that grant being reopened for us was amazing um that's exciting thank you I, I guess we were for, for your presentation we'll have questions in a little bit when when we're done with the other presentations okay guys i love your i love this cooperative um, our next presenters will be Raymond Antone and Joshua Preston from the San Javier uh, <laughs> Cooperative Farm in Tohono O'odham. Hello, can you see us and hear us? We can hear you. Hello? I can't see you. Uh, uh, hold on, let me see. We can see you now. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Um, Go ahead, Josh. Good morning. My name is Joshua Preston. I'm the food production assistant here at the Santa Rivera Co-op Farm. Uh, my name is Raymond Anton. I'm the food production supervisor. I apologize to the organizers. We've been kind of busy this past week. We're actually working overnight, so we weren't able to like check in when we needed to, and we weren't able to send in our bios and everything, and we just kind of been going consistently with our corn harvest and it's been overnight. So we've been up since yesterday. <laughs> so that ties into uh, what we're all about here at the Sun River Co-op Farm. Here, uh, we're here to educate and promote and uh, really uh, bring back the autumn way of eating. Uh, Summer is our busiest season here. We grow uh, corn, chepri beans, and squash. Those are the main three that we're going right now. And we also have watermelon in the field too. Um, the San River Cooperative Association was started back in the 70s. It was uh, due to Tucson pumping the water from the Santa Cruz River and no one was really farming anymore. So the, the people of the district were like, what are we going to do? And they decided to sue the city of Tucson. And uh, we couldn't do it without the help of the Donald Nation. So we fought Tucson and we won. And from that, we got a water settlement. And then they came together and said, what do we do now, now that we have all this water? And they said, okay, let's make a farm. And so how the farm is set up is uh, through the allottees. The allotments are uh, 
basically started from the Dawes Act of 1887. Um, so they get fractioned uh, every time uh, an Alati holder dies. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't like buy into it. You had to already be like, uh, I guess, born into it. Um, so uh, I would say that um, we do get payouts, but not very often. Um, being a farm, we don't uh, make a lot of money right now. So, uh, but our real goal as food production is to bring back the, the foods. Um, yeah. So uh, we had some pictures uh, we can share from um, our last season up to uh, winter. Oh, it says only the host can share. Um, I guess we can share. Uh, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to share the screen with me? Uh, we'll work on um, getting that, see if we can uh, make them a co-host. Yes, it is possible. So we'll get that updated and we'll try to give you permissions here shortly. Okay. So Joshua, how many acres of land is in production uh, with the Alati land that you were able to keep intact for farming? So there's, I would say like, hundreds of thousands of acres that uh, that are allotted to families, but uh, the farm operates on 800 acres and of for, land. And for the food production side, we um, slowly been making our way up. It started off pretty small, and then now we're trying to get like maybe an extra five, 10 acres just dedicated to traditional foods. Every year we're building on it. Um, last year we were at uh, about 20, 28 and then we went up to do about 35 this season and so next year we're pushing to try to get that up to like 45 acres and that include all our traditional crops um our summertime like i said we that's what we focus on that's why we're doing what we're doing right now and getting everything prepped and that's uh what we have in the store and what's available for the farm uh but our cash crop is the other eight, the other 700 acres or so is all alfalfa and all the different grasses, which they sell to cattle and everybody that's on and off the reservation. Anybody who does cattle work, anybody who needs it for horses or anything like that, we sell to them. You can share the screen now. Okay. There we go. So what we're going to be showing you is from the food production side of the farm. And it's what we did this past year through 2020, which was a pretty bumpy year for a lot of people. So for food production, it was uh, a, a really, yeah, it was really interesting um, because we only have a small group. This is all oh, the only two of us are the ones that are like the core members of the food production team. And we have um, temporary workers throughout the season, but usually they're done by uh, by next month or two, uh, but they are a big help. They help us get everything done. And without them, we wouldn't be able to get what we get done. At one point, it was just the two of us harvesting 2000 pounds last year of squash uh, every week. So it was pretty labor intensive. There we go. One more. Okay. So what we have here is uh, I believe they're chilies. Uh, but they're in the, the greenhouse and uh, we have a summer plants bill that summer and uh, we grew like uh, squash, melons, chilies, uh, just uh, what we had on hand so we can try to uh, either give it to the community or sell it to the outside, like uh, Tucson. 
Yeah, once the pandemic hit, that's all we kept saying is we just needed to keep planting and keep planting as much as possible and give away as much as possible. The best thing we could do as a farm was to just provide any kind of plants or any kind of food source for anybody who was willing to come and get it and grow it. And also on the farm, we have uh, beehives. Um, there are pollinators here. As you can see, there are flowers. And then we also grew some sunflowers that an employee of ours had, and we decided to grow them out. And now we're doing uh, like five acres of the sunflowers this year. So these are uh, mixed of like, uh, black, um, white, and uh, some uh, indigenous tribes used to. And right here is uh, what we're harvesting right now, which is a 60 acorn. It's, uh, it grows in uh, 60 days. And uh, it's a flower corn. What we use it for is uh, a dish, a traditional often dish called gaiusa. And uh, we sell it to uh, not only the community, but we give it out to the elders and uh, other uh, organizations that, that ask for it. This year has been one of the best seasons here. Um, this, this was just uh, last year's corn. Um, we spent like two, three years just roguing out uh, diseased corn and pop corn and just trying to make the corn more uh, pure six day corn and uh, through that we're successful here is just the again last year's corn and uh, seed also um, but we also had some <laughs> run-ins with uh, some coyotes mm -hmm. uh, wildlife we always over plant for them too because we know they're going to get into our fields <laughs> we don't uh, spray or uh, anything so, it, and we live practically in the, the desert, and so it's uh, pretty obvious for them to come out and try to find food. <laughs> and this is uh, what we call Goody Basho, which is a old man's chest. It's a, a melon, um, but some of it got mixed uh, and eaten a lot by the, the coyotes and the balinas <laughs> of the community. And this is a, another traditional crop called harumama, which is a, a squash. We harvest it while it's uh, young. And uh, later on, if uh, we have uh, more than we can take, we leave it out and leave it for seed. Um, this next picture is, uh, is the bigger squashes. We collect the seed from them and then we carve the rest. We uh, stream it up in the trees to, to dry it out. Um, living in the desert, we had to uh, adapt to ways of uh, either uh, trying our food to, to store it. And this is uh, one of the ways, I think it takes about a, a week or two to dry, depending how hot it is. <laughs> um, we bundle these up and then we sell them in the store for for the for people to enjoy you would just uh, put it in water and just rehydrate it and it becomes just as it was before <laughs> uh, we also grew devil's call too this year a lot of our families uh, still do traditional back basketry and we know that the nation still does it too so this is a way to support them is just the uh, growing devil claws ball devil claws oh no we lost them that's one of the problems oh, there you are we've got about another minute for you guys and then we'll have quite well i know there's going to be a lot of questions so um yeah we okay. got another minute and then we've got to move to the next presentation we just thank you for sharing all those beautiful pictures of what you're growing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that was basically the the end of our, our presentation right there too i believe
Oh, we still have uh, information up there for people so they can see it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, here's our information. Um, we do have a, an online store. So if you'd like to uh, check that out, I believe it's on there. <laughs> yeah, if you just go to our main website, you'll see it. <laughs> we also have a, a Facebook and Instagram page also. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation and for taking time away from Harvest. I know you guys are <laughs> crazy busy and we're so grateful that you were able to be here so that people could hear, you know, another example of how we can solve problems in our communities, especially with fractionized land mm. and how we can bring those landowners together to keep that land intact. And we're just really, um, Really inspired by your presentation. So, <laughs> we'll move to our next presentation, and it's uh, Candace Quam is next. Oh, it's my turn. So. <laughs> okay, I'll start. Kishay Katanao and Candace Quam let you have a tatni day and kakili awan chapter. Morning. I uh, hope your evening was nice. My name is Candace Kwam. I'm live here from Zuni Pueblo. I'll, uh, I'm hoping my internet will hold up and I can keep on the video for as long as I can. But I might turn off my video just in case. Uh, as I said, I'm from Zuni Pueblo here in New Mexico, um, right here on the reservation. Actually, I can see the one of our bigger mountains that we often call Corn Mountain or DY or Doyalani right here outside my house. So just to prove that I'm here <laughs> on reservation and my internet will probably prove that I'm on reservation pretty soon or not. Um, as I've been introduced before, I'm the marketing and research specialist for the Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico. And from there, um, I'm one of the three co-op developers in that organization. Um, and surprisingly, we're all women-led and majority of us are Native women. So the other uh, director, the co-director is Bijiba Bigay, who is a member of Navajo Nation and also a part of the tribes to the Northeast, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, that's my background. Uh, first and foremost, I am an artist, a full-time artist, and that's how my story sort of begins. So in Zuni, uh, what most people might not know is where a very uh, majority of our people are artists. It's actually most, it's more uncommon not to have a member of the family not to be involved in sort of arts. Someone always knows how to do something. It's just whether or not they make it their full-time occupation, which most people do. They either dabble or they do it full-time. And it's interesting that, but we're also as, um, big of an artist community as we are, we're also very isolated. Uh, we're about an hour, um, well, about 45 minutes away from the nearest town that has a supermarket, like Walmart, uh, Albertsons, what have you. We're about 45 minutes from there and we're about two and a half to three hours away from the biggest city, which is Albuquerque, to the east. So with that, and we're pretty isolated, as I said, so jobs aren't as uh, plentiful here. So of course, everybody turns to art. And interestingly enough, we haven't had, as dominant as we are in arts, we did not have the full control of our market until recently. Uh, in the 1970s, there was an art, a native art boom, which led to the, what most people know to be Zuni Joy. Let's see where my camera's, like right here. So, and the clarity was, the artistry is beautiful. So um, in the 70s, as I mentioned, there was a group of traders that came through with baskets, blankets, and like, we can give this to you for X amount of dollars. And of course, since the we are so isolated and jobs are plentiful here, we had to think of a different way to get these items since we needed it for religious things and also household stuff. So our thinking was like, well, we'll trade you for this. We'll give you, let's say, this ring for like five baskets or so. Like, okay, and that started to bring about the trade system here in the 70s. And that became a market since the outsiders saw like, hey, we can capitalize on this. I got this for like five blankets and I can sell it for like $100, easy. 
So and that became the artist boom. And of course, like as soon as they came through again, like, okay, I'll give I get five of those rings and I'll pay you a hundred dollars for all of them. So they would get wholesale prices, very low prices. And it's sort of created this weird hostility and this weird dynamic in our village to where before all of us were really eager to, to teach other people how to do our arts, how to carry on the style of your family's artwork. But as soon as the competition started, like, I can't teach you, I have to put food on my table for my family. I'm sorry, I can't teach you, even though you're my relative, my blood relative, I can't teach you because I have to put food on my table, unfortunately. And that just created a whole bunch of hostility and that created other people to stealing styles and it created family feuds and it was just really awful. And it's still sort of that way today. So, and it just created this market to where even though this would be valued over a hundred dollars retail, retail value, get it right there, um, easily buyers could just say like, well, okay, a fair market price would be $50 even for wholesale price per ring. But the wholesaler would say, I want, I'll pay you 20 and I want 10 more by the end of the weekend. If you can't do that, keep walking because I can find 20 other people like you if I so choose to. And unfortunately that created an awful dynamic within itself to where people will just create masses of matsu rings for like $5 each which is very unfortunate. And that's a lot of material. It's a lot of time spent on each of those pieces. It's a lot of material, especially for the, the authentic silver and stones that they were using. They created a very hostile dynamic. So as a response to that, in 2019, our steering committee and Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico uh, I'll refer to them as CCNM from now on. They gathered a group of people and they pretty much said like, wouldn't it be nice if we had like a, an organization or a group that could be an answer to all these, um, these outsiders coming in and dictating our market. These outsiders coming in are, their actual term for them are jobbers. So how can, what answer do we have for these jobbers? And CCNM just gave like, well, there's a cooperative. You can, op you can open your own gallery and you can become a collective together and you can educate your community. You can sell your artwork at your prices, how you want to, and represent yourself as you should, as you deserve to be. Another thing with this outsiders dictating the market is the demand, the demand was so high that the artists could not keep up. Uh, there was just not enough time in the day to where they could fill these orders that they had. So in response to this, outsiders created these small towns um, in overseas in China and the Philippines and named those particular villages or cities or small towns, uh, Zuni. So when they had the stamp on the back of their artwork, they would say made in Zuni, which made in Zuni, China. And if you don't really look at it too closely, you could easily be fooled. And it's still going on today. Um, it's very unfortunate. It's being sold in galleries and trading posts, and they're passing it off as real authentic Zuni art, which is not true. Uh, it's for, fortunately, it's being cracked on a little bit more uh, heavily now, but back then it was pretty rampant and it was taking food off of our tables and we had to figure out a way to do that. So our cooperative, uh, I shouldn't get to that, but the group was going to address the, the troubles of taking control of our own market and you know, proving authenticity. So that was the reasons and the base reasons of our steering committee's goal. And from then the copper uh, CCNM came through like, well, you can do this. Like, okay, so let's do that. And they kind of gave us a checklist of what to do into forming a cooperative. And everything, it was interesting how everything you should do, we just ran through it in like four months. What should take two years or probably more, we did in four months. Uh, that was the re main reason behind that is there's a very big building on the main street. There's only one street that comes through here. So you cannot get lost <laughs> when you come here. It's just like you blink and then you're out of here, more or less. So, but there is a 
in the middle village or around the middle village, there is a building that used to be a gallery. So it had all the gallery um, displays, everything that you could want in the gallery it was already set up. All you had to do is bring in your stuff. And the owner of that building happened to be Zuni, which is very fortunate on our part. And unbeknownst to us, there is some other people who are very interested in that building. One of them was a coffee shop. Another one was a Zumba and a gym a person who wanted that building for. So the owner of the building came up to the group because he just inquired, like, would it be possible? Would it be cool if or would it be OK with you if we were to rent with you? Uh, just to get a feeling, you know, just to scout out some plans like, yeah, I'm willing to work with you, but you have to get your paperwork done like yesterday because we want you, I want a Zuni led organization, but these other people have deep pockets and they want my answer. They want the space right now. So uh, we went up to CCNM who was helping us through the, um, the process to becoming a cooperative. Like, okay, so we found a place and we need to do all our incorporation, our bylaws and everything that you would need to get the building. We need that done yesterday. So we're gonna work on that. <laughs> and instead of, uh, instead of, you know, like, no, we can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. We're gonna go through the, the process like as it should be. It was more of, um, okay, let's go, let's, let's try this, let's do this. And it was very nice to know how flexible that CCNM could be towards us, especially since, and they helped us with all the paperwork. And if you haven't worked with artists before, the natural enemy of an artist is paperwork. <laughs> and that's just pretty much how it is, unfortunately. And they helped us through all the paperwork and it is, very fortunate that they had a lot of resources. They have a lawyer on their team, or I should say our team. We have a lawyer in our team, a lot of people with cooperative experience, uh, development experience. They, they could help us through all the, the different uh, hurdles that we have to go through, hurdles and her hopes and what have you. And within four months, amazingly, from the first meeting that they went through, which was probably in February, and um, in May, we already got the building and we could move in. And our soft opening actually happened to be in July, I wanna say, which is amazing. We just had to, and everything was really, it was well kept. We didn't have to do anything really. We just had to move in and we were ready. <laughs> and we opened with no publicity at all. We didn't have any advertising, no flyers, but it was all word of mouth. And we got our, it was amazing how we could recruit other artists as well. We do have some heavy hitters in our field. And which is all through word of mouth, through our collectors and our buyers. We're like, hey, there's a cooperative happening down here. And everyone is really riled, uh, riled and got her back. So it was amazing. We weren't anticipating to make a profit in the first year. Of course, it probably takes about two years as we were expecting to create a profit of any sort. But through the word of mouth and through a series of smaller and bigger miracles <laughs> from the first meeting to where we are now, uh, we, first year we made a phenomenal profit and we were very thankful for it. And we did get some funding. We had a GoFundMe. We had some grants that Portuguese CCNM could write and do all the paperwork for us. So they were very instrumental in helping us get the, pretty much this off the ground. Um, which is amazing. And they help in understanding how our cultural backing is since Zuni is very culturally, very in the, the mind of like, together we thrive, one heart, one mind, more or less. So together we, we made this wonderful cooperative. Uh, sorry. I ate some seeds earlier and it's uh, <laughs> stuck in my throat. I, that was a bad mistake. <laughs> I apologize. But yes, it was very amazing to see how that happened. And our cooperative was thriving. Visitors were coming every day. And of course, 2020 hit, the pandemic hit. And unfortunately, Zuni Pueblo was very hit hard in the, in the waves of the pandemic. So we had to pedal back. We had all sorts of programs that we were planning, a studio 
poet tour program. There's so many programs that we wanted to do and initiatives, but we had to put that on the back burner. And now we had to focus on surviving. So in response to that, we made our website. We, we have been talking about it for a while, but that just put a uh, lit a fire more or less to create the website, create all these other initiatives to get the get money and keep our doors open, but most importantly to keep our artists financially stable. So, so with that, oh, wonderful. Yeah, and the, our website's in the chat right now. If you want to drop by and look what we have, I, we just got some more inventory, just so you know, and I'll be uploading more in these coming days. So, and we do have our, all of what's in the gallery right now is in the website, except for like about 15 items that we just got recently. So I'm still in the midst of uh, processing that. Oh, I didn't, didn't mention that I'm also a member of this cooperative and I'm also, I also happen to be on the board. So it's weird how life works. <laughs> um, Candace, thank you so much for your presentation that we're, they're running a little bit behind and we wanted to be able to have um, some questions, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. I need to clear up my throat from the mistake. I know. I Mine's really <laughs> dry, too. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and being here. And uh, I'm not quite sure how we want to do the questions. Uh, I think we have time here for um, one or two questions. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, we, we did get a little bit behind schedule here and I just we didn't want to take away from hearing these incredible stories and, and hearing from the amazing work that you all are doing. So, so grateful for um, the time that you've been able to uh, share with us today. And so if you have a question here, I think we have time for one or two to uh, answer. If you want to submit them into the chat box, we'll take a look at those. We hope that the people that are here today are inspired by these stories of our communities and how people have come together to solve problems. And I think what inspires me most of all is our communities are reclaiming their own narrative and with a focus on the cultural, social, environmental, and financial uh, goals that are most of most relevance to them. And what I love is what we're seeing is a, a new cooperativism that's the, a model that's emerging uh, where the cooperative structures are being used by our communities as, uh, as agents of decolonization, self-determination, and revitalization of our uh, cultural life ways. So that's something that we're really proud of. And we're really excited about the new co-ops and then our co-ops like Res Chicks and then uh, San Javier, what they're doing and how long they've been around, but how they've even grown. Uh, they're cooperative to meet the needs of their communities and they're responsive to their community members, you know, with the example of growing that root for the baskets and uh, taking care of their elders and their communities and what Candace was sharing about see if we have any questions and then we can it looks like we um, are going to, what we'll do is if you have questions throughout the day, uh, what we'll do is we'll connect you with those presenters. Uh, I know also that their information we'll be sure to share on the, our resource webpage that we'll share out that link to. So uh, I'm appreciative of all of our presenters today. Thank you so much um, for your time. And Pamela, we appreciate you being here as well and really um, look forward to being able to share out more information um, about the uh, Minnesota Business Alliance. So thank you so, for that.